happy 4th of July weekend, church. I'm Pastor Amanda, and I'm really happy that you're here this morning watching this, or perhaps this afternoon watching this, or perhaps even this evening. Wherever you are watching this, though, I want you to know that you are greeting Jesus. You made that choice to greet Jesus. But the good news really is, is that wherever you are watching this, Jesus has already greeted you there. And we give thanks and we celebrate that. And many of us are celebrating the 4th of July this weekend. Maybe you are, maybe you are at your cabin or you're with friends or family, or maybe you're just taking it easy in your own home. But as followers of Jesus, we have to remember too, that we serve a love that is beyond our national identity. We are Christ followers. And the love that we serve in Jesus uh, is one that remind, reminds us not really of independence, but it actually reminds us of interdependence. So I offer you a happy interdependence weekend, uh, friends in Christ. The service is going to be an abbreviated service uh, with some diverse voices. You will hear from Reverend Henry Dolope at Portland Avenue uh, United Methodist Church in Minneapolis. And he's going to briefly just share his energy and his passion for Christ uh, and what it means for him to be rooted in Christ. And then the word and the ways in which you will encounter the living Christ through scripture and preaching will be from the Reverend Bethany Nelson from Messiah United Methodist Church in Plymouth. And of course, our hymns that we will sing along to in this worship service will be led by members of our Grace Choir. So happy Interdependence Day, friends. kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things shall be added unto you hallelujah what a privilege what a joy to know that Jesus loved me and because he loved me I can do all things through Christ who gave me strength I am excited daily to reciprocate Jesus' love to all by being in a community, standing with the poor and the marginalized, sometimes confessing and repenting of my wrong and offering forgiveness. Thanks be to God for my Wesleyan heritage that provides a space and place to receive and offer grace. Amen. shepherd who lived in Bethlehem. 
David was chosen by God to be the next king of Israel when he was just a boy. But David had to wait a very long time until that promise would come true because there was another king of Israel named Saul. Saul led the armies of Israel. One day, King Saul was with his army near the Valley of Elah. On the other side of this valley, the Philistines, the enemies of Israel, gathered their army ready to fight. The Philistines had a giant warrior named Goliath who challenged the Israelites. Hey! Goliath spoke badly of God and his people. He shouted and taunted them, saying, Choose one man to come down here and fight me. The Israelites and King Saul were very afraid. Meanwhile, David's father sent David to bring some food to his brothers and their captain. Goliath came out of the Philistines' army, and David heard him shout his usual mean taunts to the army of Israel. Whoa, what? As soon as the Israelites saw Goliath, they began to run away in fright. See ya. David asked, who is this Philistine anyway that he has allowed to defy the armies of the living God? David's questions were reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him. Uh, hi. David said, don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. Saul said, there's no way you can fight him and win. You're only a boy. Wait. But David told Saul that he had taken care of his father's sheep and rescued them from lions and bears. Then David declared, The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and bear will rescue me from this Philistine. So Saul said, All right, go ahead and may the Lord be with you. David picked up five smooth stones from a stream. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight Goliath. When Goliath saw him coming, he sneered at him and yelled bad things at David. But David said, You come to me with a sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of Heaven's armies. Goliath moved closer to attack, and David quickly ran out to meet him. He hurled a stone from his sling and hit Goliath in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell to the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. But he knew the power of God and trusted God to win the battle against the giant. <laughs> this is pretty fun, isn't it, watching these videos? <laughs> yes, I like hearing your chuckles. Good morning, beloveds. As you are seeing, we are on week two of our series, Epic Tales. Last week, you'll remember, we were with Daniel in the lion's den. And today, we're gathering up our slingshots, and we're learning and remembering the story of David and Goliath. For those of us who grew up in church and attended Sunday school and vacation Bible school, this might be a familiar story for you. And you might have songs or memories about learning this story that gets stuck in your head as we talk about it today. But I'm guessing that few of us have really dug in and studied this story as adults. And so today, we're going to change that. To start, we're going to learn a little bit about our young one, David. Other than Jesus, the Bible says more about the life of David than any other character in Scripture. And his story reminds us of how complicated and nuanced our lives are. That is because David exemplifies both the very best and the very worst of us. He reminds us that as humans, we are all simultaneously sinner and saint. That is, we are God's good and beloved children, and we're not perfect. And despite his many imperfections, David is known for his great and mighty acts, as king of Israel. He is also one of the most influential writers in scripture, and we attribute much of the book of Psalms to King David. And though his story is told mostly within the books of 1 and 2 Samuel, we hear his story, his name, his legacy throughout the entire Bible in both Old and New Testaments. David's story begins at a time in Israel's history where they are being led by kings. The people previously had been led by judges and prophets, but they were tired of that and had asked God to give them a king. 
King Saul, who we heard in the video, was the first king. And through a series of events that you can study on your own or maybe join and create a small group to learn about, uh, it was time for the next king to be anointed. And so God sent the prophet Samuel to the home of Jesse in Bethlehem and assured him that the next king of Israel would be found there. Samuel arrives. He meets seven of Jesse's sons, and son after son are presented to them. We can imagine them lining up, these, these soldiers and these strong men, these probably good-looking men. David, they tell us later, is good-looking. So the rest of the family is here, and they're leaders, and we can see that they're standing there probably pretty proud and ready to be drafted and anointed as the next king. Time after time, Samuel meets these sons, and God is quiet. They begin to murmur and wonder if God is not choosing the best among us, and certainly we are the best among us, who will God call? Samuel says to Jesse, God has no regard for appearance or stature. God doesn't look at things like humans do. Humans see only what is visible to the eyes, but the Lord sees into the heart. God reminds us that the things that we care about when choosing a leader um, are not the same as the things that God cares about, that God brings a different perspective. And so while we might look at resumes or strength at education, at one's skills as a speaker or a soldier um, or a judge, that, that God looks past all of these attributes and looks to their heart. And so when none of these seven sons have been chosen, uh, Jesse then tells Samuel, I mean, there is another one, he says. I've got one more. His name is David. He's the youngest. He's out in the field watching the sheep. He's such an unlikely candidate. We didn't even think to bring him here with all the other sons. He's not a soldier. He's a musician. He's a shepherd. And he is no one that anyone would expect God to choose, which gives us a hint right away of what's going to happen next, right? So Jesse brought David in, and Scripture tells us that he was reddish brown, he had beautiful eyes, and he was very good looking. And the Lord said, that's the one, go anoint him. And so from that moment forward, David, the youngest, the one who was easily overlooked, the one no one had even considered, was chosen and anointed by God to be the next king of Israel. If the people had voted, David wouldn't have stood a chance. He was the wrong candidate. He wasn't even invited. Nobody saw this coming except God because God knew David's heart. And through this selection, God invites us to look for leaders in another way. What is at the heart of the people who lead you? What is at the heart of the people who inspire and guide you? What are their motivations, their longings, their hopes? God reminds us that success, as the world defines, is not the same rubric as the one which God uses. And so this reminds us of the first lesson from David's story. God sees possibilities even when others cannot. This is a lesson echoed throughout Scripture, and for good reason, because it's a lesson we need constant reminders of in our own daily lives. How many of us have excluded ourselves from even considering something that we maybe have felt God calling us toward because we don't think that we're enough. We're not good enough or ready enough. We haven't been educated in the right way. Um, maybe we feel like we're too old or we're too young or we don't have the right skills. Maybe you think, I'm just not very good with people and of course they're going to reject me. I'm going to fail and then everyone will laugh. God sees possibilities even when others cannot even when we cannot see them ourselves, God sees the heart. God knows your heart and your possibilities to share God's love with your neighbors. God will use you. God will anoint you and call you to serve in a way that might be challenging, that might be scary, that might even seem impossible, but through you, through your words and your actions and your love, God sees possibility, and God will make a way. Throughout scripture, we've seen this time and time again. We saw it in Moses, and we heard about him just a few weeks ago. He was a man who, you know, had fled from the home of his upbringing. He couldn't speak well, and yet he was called to lead and proclaim God's people out of slavery. 
We see it in Mary, a young woman who wasn't yet ready for motherhood, a person who by all cultural expectations would not be accepted for being too young or too poor and not from the right place, and yet she was called and invited by God to be the mother of God's own son. And you have your own story to tell too. A time, I'm guessing, when you felt like the impossible choice and still God chose you. Here at Messiah Church, we are proud of two of our young people who have heard God calling them to care for those around them who experience food insecurity. Now, I know that collecting funds and donated food is a common practice for many churches and organizations, but it's unusual to look at the youngest among us as leaders along the way. But you know Ashley and Emily, who are 8 and 11 this year. They have discovered the ways that God sees possibilities in them. And if you've been around Messiah Church for a while, you've heard their story of Cocoa Cafe. You've heard about their efforts, and maybe you've even had a cup of their cocoa too. But I'm telling you their story again today because of this. A few months ago, you'll remember that Bishop Lynette was here at Messiah, and she preached. On that day, she learned about Ashley and Emily and their Coco Cafe. And when our bishop learned this story, she was so moved by their witness that she said, others have to hear their story too. Because God sees possibilities even when others cannot. And our bishop knew that by telling the story of Emily and Ashley, by telling the story of Coco Cafe, that others might be inspired to notice the ways that God is calling them and that others might be given courage to say yes to God too. And so the story, I'm going to call them our girls, right, because they're part of our family. The story of our girls was told this year at the gathering of the Minnesota Annual Conference, which you heard about. We gathered just a little over a week ago. It's a time where all 330 churches, Methodist churches from around the state, come together, both clergy and laity. It's in our days together... We celebrate, we discern, we commit to God's continued work among us. And so lift it up among the legislation that we passed, among the ordinations and the retirements that we marked, was also this story of our girls, Emily and Ashley, and their work of Coco Cafe. We put together a story, or we, I want to show you the video that uh, the bishop and the conference shared at annual conference. So let's watch that together now. Emily was six years old and had an idea to do a cocoa stand. And as the idea started becoming something we were really going to do, we talked about how we can do this, but we're not going to keep the money. We need to find, you know, some way to help others with this. And it worked out really well that it was Minnesota Food Share Month and our church was having a competition between the youth, the older kids, and the younger kids to see who could bring in more boxes of cereal. So that year, we helped, Emily and Ashley helped the younger kids win because of the Coco Cafe that we started that year. So that's where it all started. We do this for three hours in March on a Saturday morning, and cars drive by and stop and then come in our driveway, and we ask them if they'd like hot cocoa or coffee. Things we have at the Coco Cafe are, we have cocoa, coffee, and s'mores. Right at the bottom of our driveway, we set up our furniture and our fire pit and then a long table that has the cocoa, coffee, and coffee creamers and marshmallows. And then people can either help themselves or we serve them. And then there's there's plenty of seating for people to stay a while and chat and catch up and enjoy their coffee. And then at the fire pit, we've got our, our skewers so people can roast their marshmallows and make their s'mores and enjoy those too. We have aprons and hats, and then we also have these fun sleeves for our cups. I love the Coco Cafe because um, we get to see a lot of people that we haven't seen for a little bit, and we get to help other people. All through our time at Messiah, we've been there over 10 years now, a foundational message that is always sent through everything that the church does is that we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So as 
we're doing these things with the Coco Cafe, that is something that we try to keep at the forefront of our minds. You know, yes, we want to make it perfect. Yes, we want it to be fun. But at the end of the day, what we're doing is helping others, and that is what Jesus would want people to do when they have the opportunity. People at our church come and support us, and they get really happy. We feel confident doing this, knowing that, you know, People will come and people will be helped at the end of the day and that's what it's all about. People donate to the Coco Cafe and then we take it to the food shelves. For the last two years, an anonymous donor has matched our, our money we raised and it, it's gotten us a lot of money to raise for the food shelves. This year we raised $8,000. Um, and for the last six years, we've raised over $18,000. Over the last six years, with the money we've raised, the food shelves can turn that $1 into $9, so the full amount would be over $160,000 that they've had to buy food for those that need it. It makes me feel really proud of myself. What about you, Ashley? It makes me feel like I did something really good for other people. You feel proud and hopeful for our church too, don't you? And so did the hundreds of people that gathered at the Minnesota Annual Conference. That room was filled with applause and tears and smiles and joy and amazement and reminders that God sees possibilities in us even when others cannot. Emily and Ashley, I know that you are watching worship today online and so good morning to you. And I want to say this to you, we are so proud of you. We're proud of the way that you hear God calling you to love others, to share your gifts with others, and the ways that you are the hands and feet of Jesus. Thank you for showing us, for teaching us, and for leading the way. Isaiah said, the child will lead them, and here they do. God sees our hearts and possibilities within us. Do you believe this, church? Can you see others around you, the children among us, the one who has a bad reputation, the one who doesn't think or believe anything like you? Can you see their heart? Can you see them as God does? Can you look in the mirror and see yourself and see within you possibilities? Can you see the ways that God is at work in your life? God sees possibilities even when others cannot. This lesson from David continues, and now we're going to jump ahead to the next chapter in David's life, which is also our primary story for today. So setting the scene, the biggest enemies of Israel have made their way and are trying to occupy land near Bethlehem, splitting the kingdom of Israel in two. And Israel brings their army to confront them, the Philistines, each army is using the land around them as protection, and neither one of them are daring to leave that protected area to go to open ground in the valley. And so for several weeks, they sit here, deadlocked, until finally the Philistines send their mightiest warrior down to the valley. And we read, Goliath was more than nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet and wore bronze scale armor weighing 125 pounds. His spear was as strong as the bar on a weaver's loom, and its iron head weighed 15 pounds. He shouted, select one of your men and let him come down against me. If he is able to fight me and kill me, we will become your slaves. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will serve us. This was traditional practice in ancient warfare. It was a way to settle disputes without having a big and major battle. So for 40 days, Goliath took his stand, and none of the Israelites dared to fight him. But who can blame them? It seemed impossible to win. And so entering into the valley seemed nothing more than a death wish. Enter David. He's not a soldier like the rest of his brothers, but he has been in the fields yet tending sheep, and now his dad has sent him to deliver bread and cheese to the camp. He gets to the camp and sees everything going on and asks one of his brothers what's happening. His older brother mocks him, essentially saying, what are you doing here? Have you come, just come to watch a fight? Go on. Get back to where you belong. 
These are words that any of us with siblings can automatically hear in our head a little bit, right? We know that taunting or dismissiveness that comes from an older sibling. In case we need reminders that siblings have been getting after each other forever, and it's not just your children or your grandchildren that do it, here's the, the scriptural evidence of that. David responds to his brother, what have I done? It was just a question. <laughs> I can hear my kid's voice in that. But now, surprising everyone, David then turns to King Saul and says, I'll go. I'll go fight him. Saul and the others dismiss David. You're just a boy. And even though we know that David has been anointed by God as the next king, he's not king yet. And it seems that the others around him aren't aware of that or aren't remembering that. Instead, they're looking and seeing just a shepherd boy, a little kid who doesn't belong on a battlefield, especially against a giant that is scaring every other soldier around. But David is adamant. He goes on to explain that even though he's not a soldier, that he knows how to protect his sheep against predators. David sees possibility. He had learned to see things as God sees. He didn't see himself as an underdog. He saw him somebody, as himself as someone who was called by God, blessed by God, and David was ready, ready to take his shot, literally, so agreeing or acquiescing, the people then try to fit David for, in armor for the battle. But David rejects that too. He can't wear armor that weighs as much as him. And instead, he reaches down and he grabs five stones off the ground and he puts it into his shepherd's bag and begins walking towards Goliath. The tension is building in the story, and Goliath is taunting David now too, but as the youngest of eight, as we've heard, David is no stranger to taunting, and it has no influence over him, and so he continues to walk forward, and we can picture it, Goliath, nine feet tall, this warrior dressed in armor that weighs more than David does, ready to face off against David, who is wearing clothing that would protect and camouflage him in the field. He's carrying a slingshot and a walking stick. David takes a stone, then he puts it into his sling. He rolls it around and lets it fly. At some point, some of you might be singing in your head about this, a song that you've learned once. And round and round and round and round and round and round it goes. Anyone? Just me? No? Okay, maybe it's just me. The rock flies through the air. And that single rock hits Goliath right between the eyes. He falls down dead or unconscious. And then David takes Goliath's own sword and beheads him. The battle is won. And here's our second lesson from the life of David. God doesn't call the equipped, the expected. God equips the called now let's dive a little deeper into this story. And I might tell you something that you haven't learned or thought about when you were children. Now, we were taught that David had just a few stones and a slingshot as his weapons of choice, and we imagine that he made this slingshot out of sticks that came off the tree, something that my boys like to do when they're playing outside, and that it's just this simply constructed slingshot. But in ancient warfare, and some of you probably remember this, there are three kinds of warriors. We've got the cavalry, men on horseback and chariots. We've got the heavy infantry, the foot soldiers with swords and shields. And then finally, we have the artillery, right? These are the archers or slingers. And so Goliath is part of the heavy infantry, and he was ready and prepared to battle in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He expected to meet somebody of the same, but David was not going to fight him this way. David spent his days using this sling to protect his sheep against wolves and predators. This was his strength. The sling that David and others would carry now would be this leather pouch with two cords connected. And then after you placed a rock inside, which by the way is said to have been maybe a little smaller than a tennis ball, they would whirl it around and around and around. And as it flew through the air, it would only pick up speed. This is not a child's toy. This is a devastating weapon. I read someplace this week that as it spins through the air, it could pick up speeds as high as 78 miles per hour. And this rock becomes deadly as it goes through the air. It's a handgun of the ancient world. And so David and his slingshot were not unprepared, but they were ready. 
and prepared just in a way that others had not expected. He was equipped and skilled to protect his flock with this sling, and now he would protect his people. God looks at our heart. God sees possibility. God equips us with what we're called. We don't go out into the battlefield or into our lives alone, but God will give us the tools that we need, the skills and the support to rise to the task that is set before us. David had not prepared for battling giants, but God knew that he was ready. This adjacent skill that David had was one that God had already equipped him with. Now, David did not acquire this on his own, but he was likely taught this by the same older brothers who teased him, or maybe by his dad or another shepherd, people older than David who took time to invest in him, who took time to teach and to train him the necessary skills of shepherding that equipped him with the experience and the skills to do the work at hand. None of the people who would have been mentoring David through this would have imagined that he would be defeating giants or becoming king, but their actions, their seeing possibilities in David, their investing love and care helped equip him for this call. Who are the people that have invested in your life? Who are the mentors or siblings or family that have equipped you for the adventures that God has called you on? Who are the people around you now that continue to invest and equip in you today? Let me tell you a story. On Wednesday nights here at Messiah during the school year, we've got a busy, packed house. Our choir is singing beautifully and practicing. Our kids downstairs in Kids, kids Street are learning and playing. We've got several adult faith groups that are meeting throughout the building. And our youth group gathers too. We've got middle schoolers and high schoolers that meet downstairs. Some weeks we have over 20 middle schoolers that come to church to eat pizza or subs, to learn about Jesus, to build a safe space as to be a teenager. Many weeks they watch the same video series that we're watching during our sermon series now, using it as a fun and creative way to learn more about faith. Guiding our youth is Sammy Tierney, our director of children, or of, I did it too, sorry Sammy, our director of youth ministry, and several faithful volunteers. Now, Sammy will tell you that middle schoolers are some of her favorite people on the planet. But for a lot of us, it's a really tricky age. And for anyone among us who is in middle school, you know that it's a really tricky age for you too. You're not old enough to drive or have a job, but you're old enough to want independence and to do your own thing. You're incredibly bright and capable, and yet for some reason, a lot of adults just don't seem to realize that. Maybe you kids and middle schoolers, youth today, can identify with David's story pretty well in that way, huh? Well, one of our leaders in middle school is Megan McNabb. She's a lifelong United Methodist, and she and her family have been part of Messiah Church for several years. Her spouse plays in our worship band in the second service. Her young kids fill our sanctuary and kids' street and our hallways with boundless joy. And Megan and I happen to go to college together, too, so I've known her for some years. So this week, I asked Megan, why do you volunteer with, with middle schoolers? Her kids aren't of that age yet. What led you to do this? And this is what Megan told me. She said, when we were new members, I wanted a way to get involved and meet new people. So when Sammy asked, it was an easy yes. But part of the reason it was so easy was because my own youth group experience was an important part of my teenage years. My home church was small, but we had a few adults that were really invested in us. We did a lot of fundraising and mission trips, and those trips shaped who I am today. They led me to my major in college, to my career choices. And I thought, if youth group could be that impactful for me, I knew I wanted to create space for that possibility for other kids, too. She continued, I've been so impressed by our middle schoolers. They are discovering themselves and God, and figuring out some really big questions about life. I'm honored to be a small piece of that journey and want them to know that there are adults who care about them. Megan's witness this week inspired me because she shows me the full picture of how God is at work in our life. God saw possibility in Megan as a child, 
and equipped her with adults to invest in her, to care for her, to raise her up, so that now as an adult she can bring this full circle and repeat with a new generation. God has equipped Megan in her work with middle schoolers, and it's because of her and others like her that our next generation will grow up knowing that they are seen, that they are valued, and that they are loved. God sees possibilities even when others cannot. God doesn't call the equipped. God equips the called. David was chosen against all odds to be the next king of Israel. He volunteered against any popular or unpopular opinion to battle Goliath. David was not a perfect person. These two elements of his story that we heard today are really great, but he's got a lot of layers to his life. And like all of us, he has times in his life where he doesn't follow God well, that he doesn't listen very well to where God is calling him. And in fact, there are times where he disobeys God and he causes a lot of harm, and he is not the hero of the day. And I say this because if you're starting to think that maybe it's impossible for God to look at you like God looked at David or like God looked at Emily and Ashley and Megan, that maybe you're still thinking that you're not the right person because you've done too many things that are wrong, or this voice in your head says, it just can't possibly be me. Like, they have set themselves on the right track, and they were young when this happened, and I'm too old, and I didn't do the right thing, and I spent too much time ignoring God already. What's the use? God doesn't really care about that. God sees possibility in you. God has equipped you to follow God's call in your life, to serve God, to love your neighbor, to love your world. God chose David seeing possibilities when others could not. God sees this same possibility in you. God doesn't use perfect people in perfect situations to show God's love. God chooses you and me, normal, everyday people, ordinary people, to do extraordinary things. And in the children and the youth of our church, God sees in them too, not just the possibility to be the church or to share God's love someday when they grow up, but to right now, be messengers and prophets and leaders of God's message of love and hope for our world. The gifts that God will give to you, to me, to each of us, the places and people that God will call us to serve will not look the same as the person sitting next to us, and neither will the giants in life that you will face. But to all of us, God sees possibility, and God invites us into opportunities to make an impact in our lives and in our world. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about this a bit, and so I'm going to read to you a little passage from the message translation. Paul says, God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere, but God is behind it all. Each person is giving something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. Each of us have a unique gift and way to change the world, even in one person. David's story encourages us to see it even when others cannot, even if others might be discouraging us. God sees possibility in you. God calls you and God equips you to love and change the world. So how might God be calling you today? I wonder this week what you might learn from God if you take a little extra time and intention to listen. Maybe you can find a a rock or a stone of your own today outside. Maybe you can take a little time to hold it in your hand, to feel its weight in your palm, and consider the people and places that God is inviting you to serve. And then when doubt or worry creeps in, grip that rock tightly and remember God sees possibility in you. God equips you. God loves you. Let's pray. God of all nations and of ours, as people of a nation who like to sing of freedom, we turn to you, O freedom curator. Help us make this land free, free from hatred of religious difference, free from exploitation of laborers, 
free from damage to the land and water so long cared for by our indigenous brothers and sisters, free from contempt for immigrants who invest in this nation's thriving, and free from the new slavery of the prison system that tears apart so many black and brown families. Inspire us, O oh God, to be brave, brave in the face of religious and racial violence, brave in contrast to the cowardice that would pit us against each other based on our race or our class, brave in order to care for the refugees of all sorts to which our scripture calls us, brave in order to do your will even when doing so is so unpopular. God, even as we celebrate the blessings of this nation, help us be humble enough to know that you really are the God of all nations. As Americans in this complex global landscape, root us in the truth that you do not honor human-made boundaries, but instead you honor the divinity and dignity of each person whom you've made in your own image. Ignite us into being people who work to build earnestly a land where all are free and a home where we, your followers, are brave in doing all the good we can in all the ways we can to all the people we can as long as ever we can. And so we pray now, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Followers of Jesus, I send you forth now with this declaration of interdependence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all life is interconnected and endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights and responsibilities, that among these are presence, compassion, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights and responsibilities, we open our minds and our hearts to the needs of others, 
and to our own true needs. We hear the sound of the living universe in our ears and we add our voices to that song. We live every moment with awareness of the purity and power of existence itself. And for the support of this declaration, we pledge to love each other with our breath. For the freedom of the one is the freedom of the all. And the pain of the one is the pain of the all. The breath of the one is the breath of the all. And the breath of the all is the breath of God. Go in peace, friends. Amen.